There we go. This meeting is being recorded. So again, if you do um, unmute yourself and talk, which when I when I ask for questions would be great, you can you can do that. But just know that your voice will be recorded, and I am going to send this out to everyone who registered. So I just want to be careful that to make sure you know that just because if you share any like personal health information that that your privacy is not guaranteed. So always thinking of the worst case scenario. But yeah, okay, and Kelly wears the comfy brace and they don't have the grippers. Yeah, yeah, and I have another iMac pair that does not have the little grips. So it's kind of up to personal preference, but especially when I'm driving, I like these because it kind of grips the steering wheel. Oh, and you need extra small. Yeah, these are just small, but they're pretty tight for, for me. So anyway, welcome to the Build Your Rheumatic Disease Toolkit workshop slash webinar, whatever we want to call this. And so you are in the right place if you have a rheumatic disease. A rheumatic disease is not just rheumatoid arthritis. It's anything in that similar umbrella like psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, of course, ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondylitis. And even lupus is kind of considered in that same overall category. Um, and some of these tips will also work for things like fibromyalgia, which I know some people have both over rheumatic, you know, reg, uh, arthritis type disease plus fibromyalgia. And so you're also in the right place if you are confused or overwhelmed about what even is a flare up, what can I do, and did I cause it, how to prevent it. Now I wish, I will tell you in advance, like I wish that this was like, I'm giving you all the secrets to never have a flare up again, but unfortunately, <laughs> Autoimmune diseases are notoriously very complicated and tricky. And so I don't have all the answers, but I could at least help you understand kind of the difference between things you can control and things you can't control. So we don't like stress out too much over things we can't control because that's that's not helpful for us. And then it's also for you if you're just feeling a little bit alone, like I got this diagnosis and now what? What am I supposed to do? I need more information. Um, that's one of my soap boxes. If you heard me before, I have a lot of soap boxes. One of them is that patients with these rheumatic diseases need a lot more volume, quality and quantity. So quantity and quality of uh, patient education. It is not enough to do one 20 minute doctor's appointment every three months to understand how to cope with these diseases. So that's why I do partly what I do. Um, and so we're going to wait, did I already introduce? Oh no, there we go. Um, we're, the little agenda for today, we're going to define our terms. We're going to talk about preventing and coping with fatigue, pain, stress, and the overall process of discovering your triggers. Um, these are all really long, complex topics. Like each one of these could be like a three hour webinar. So it's going to be fast. I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> um, and you just know that I will uh, send out a recording of this so that you can kind of, kind of like pause it <laughs> and let things percolate. And so I mean, it's pretty self-evident, like why should we learn this stuff? But just in case, the overall goal is to like improve your quality of life and well-being and overall happiness and satisfaction and being able to love your life even despite rheumatic disease. Because again, unfortunately, no matter how perfect you are, sometimes flare-ups just come out of, nor come out of nowhere. So um, we want to live the best life we can despite them. And so a little quick introduction to me. Some of you know me from social media or other presentations I've given, but I've had rheumatoid arthritis for 18 years, almost 19. I'm turning 40 this year. I got diagnosed on my 21st birthday. Um, and I've been an occupational therapist for eight years and little disclaimer. So even though I'm an occupational therapist and I love answering people's questions, I have to be really careful because I can't give any of you medical advice. And this, this talk itself is considered like general education. It's not considered like you're not receiving occupational therapy right now. I don't think anyone's like super confused about that, but like if you if you ask a question, I answer it. But your your own occupational therapist says something different. Always go with the person who's actually treating you. And if I give you an answer, it's not meant to be interpreted as medical advice. Just general education. I try to be really careful with how I answer things, but sometimes I'm a little impulsive, so I'm always worried I'm going to like accidentally um, cross that line. So. Um, I guess awareness is the first step. Um, I'm also a mom, a dog mom and a human mom. And I founded Arthritis Life. It's like a little educational company. It's a, officially a business, um, but it's like 
I'm kind of joke. It's like kind of like a nonprofit because I'm not really making a profit, but it's not structured as a nonprofit. Unfortunately, like well, that's a whole other thing, but nonprofits, I, I think it's makes sense that people really want to donate for like a cure. They want to donate for research and a cure. Uh, patient education and support groups tend to kind of be the first things that are cut with nonprofits. And that's true of the arthritis focused ones as well, sadly. So I'm like, I, I, to make it sustainable, this was the most straightforward and clear structure. Also, I like control and, and that if you, if you have a nonprofit, you don't, as the founder, get all the control over the decisions that the board of directors does. So I was like, I want to be able to do exactly what I want, say what I want and give it people the best education that I think it exists. So, and I created a rheumatoid arthritis roadmap. Uh, online course and the Room to Thrive support group, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about later. But um, it, this topic of you know managing and preventing flare-ups falls under the category of my T in the Thrive. I'm really obsessed with acronyms. So T stands for tools for pain and fatigue. But also we're going to talk about actually a lot of these you know healthy habits as well, which includes like you know a nutrition, sleep, exercise, and inner world, which includes like stress management. So um, so it all, and then executive functions falls under the umbrella of tr tracking your flare up trigger. So it all interrelates, but let's start off. So I have 64 slides. I'm sorry. I'm going to go really fast, but I just, I have so much I want to say. Um, and oh, please feel free to like ask any questions in the chat as we go along. Um, and then at the end, I'll have time for more of like a live Q and A. And I might, if I don't answer your question right away, it's just cause I'm like waiting till the appropriate time to answer it. So, okay, what is a flare up? If you're confused, you're not alone because there's actually no one specific definition of an autoimmune disease flare up. It is, um, most agree that it's a period of exacerbation of symptoms. So that, but that could be pain and or stiffness and or fatigue. So you can have a fatigue of, or a flare up of fatigue, for example, but not pain or pain and not fatigue or all of the above. So, and, and no one has like, it's not like if you have had a, a exacerbation of symptoms that last more than 10 days, it's officially a flare up. There isn't like, again, one universal definition. So if your doctor's asking me, like my doctor's asked me for like, are you flaring right now? And I'll be like, well, what's your definition of a flare? And I'll, or I'll say, I'm having, I've been having worsening pain or stiffness like over the last X amount of weeks or days. Some people will say like, I'm really flaring today, meaning like just for one day, I've had worse symptoms versus a prolonged period. So um, just know that like when you're out and about in the community of uh, autoimmune warriors, you might, people are gonna use the same word and mean different things. So um, what causes them? So it's in general, because um, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, these rheumatic diseases, they are from your immune system attacking your healthy joint or healthy cells and tissues in the case of RA and your joints. And um, so it can be caused by anything that is causing inflammation and inflammation is your immune system's response to what it perceives as a threat. It, you might have inflammation from a virus, like an outside virus. You might have just natural inflammation from your body uh, starting the autoimmune process, like for whatever reason, it decides in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, to attack the synovial lining of your joints. It says, okay, the synovial lining of your joints, that's the same thing as like a virus. And it starts uh, um, driving inflammation to that area of your joints. Um, it can also be caused by anything else that your body is perceiving as like an outside threat. It could be things like allergies, or sometimes this is where the nutrition part comes in. Sometimes food sensitivities can, can trigger it. So um, other things can include like your, your activity. So overexertion, like, uh, I think we've all had that kind of, we can sometimes people call it like a a hangover feeling of like, oh man, I overdid it yesterday. And now I have like a, um, a, a hangover of, of activity or, um, stress is a huge trigger for flares for people smoking, or again, you know, weather changes would be another external. So there's kind of like, again, the things that are caused by your activity, like things you can control versus the external factors you can't, to some degree, of course, you can control your exposure to an infection. 
but you can't always control it perfectly, right? So again, I really like on the Arthritis Foundation website where they, they have some great patient education you know, blogs and materials. And the Arthritis Foundation is the nonprofit in the United States that's devoted to helping finding a cure and, um, and um, supporting people with arthritis. And they, they divided it into two categories. You have your predictable flares, again, where you know the trigger and sometimes you might have some control over it. So like my, my example I always use is I went on a hike with my husband and my son for two and a half hours. And normally my activity level is about 20 to 25 minutes of consecutive exercise. So I'll do like an exercise bike for 20 to 25 minutes. So if you go from 20 to 25 minutes to two and a half hours, just logically that's that's more than you can probably handle for a lot of people, but especially if you have a rheumatic disease. So overexertion, and again, other known, known triggers could be stress, infection, not taking your medication. Um, another thing that could cause a flare up is your medication wearing off or not working as well over time. Those of you who've had um, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, for a long time might have experienced this if you've been on biologic medications like I have. I just started my fourth biologic in 18 years because um, in the last three, they all worked really well for a while, but then my body, my immune system created antibodies to the medicine. So the medicine like quote unquote, wasn't working as well. Um, and it's because of your own immune system. I like to say like your immune system is smart enough or kind of stupid enough to attack your healthy joints and, and healthy cells, but smart enough to outsmart the medication, unfortunately. Sometimes, not always, some people's bodies don't do that. So again, not a lot of uh, black and whites, a lot of gray areas. So there's the predictable ones, you can control something about it. Um, in the case of the medication, you can take a different medication. But there's also a whole category of unpredictable flares, flare-ups with no known trigger. In general, the flare-ups that are that have a known trigger or it's something that you did, and like like the, again the food sensitivities or things like that, you they they tend to be the short-term flare-ups. Again, when I when I um did that hike for about forty-eight hours, I was really fatigued, and then but I but it resolved because again it was a short-term thing versus an unpredictable flare where hmm, I haven't really changed any of my activity, my medications, and all I'm just experiencing. I call it like a simmer first. If like you get like a small amount of increased pain, stiffness, fatigue, and then it suddenly like, it, or then it slowly gets worse over time. And then sometimes I've had it where it just reaches a breaking point. And that, that's like my most recent medication change. It was like, okay, we've crossed the line. Now we got to do something different. So um, these, the ones where we don't have a known trigger tend to be the ones that are less likely to resolve over time. It, and Emma, I mean, there is no average, like the average, um, that I, there's no average that I know of in, in the sense that the average wouldn't really tell the story because there's a lot of people where it works for like three to six months. And there's people like me where it's typically for me about four to six years. And then there's people I know, like my friend Christy, she's been on Remicade for 12 years. And I know people who've been on Emerald for 15 years. So if you take the average of like 15 years, six years, and you know, six months, it would be like the average would be like five to six years. But that doesn't mean that you are going to experience that, unfortunately. So yeah, I, I know that a lot of rheumatologists and researchers are really trying to figure out like how to predict better who, which people will work better on which kinds of medications and then um, and do like, what is it called? Like bio individual kind of um, treatments so that we're not just having so much of a guessing game. So again, this is really where it, the stress management comes in as well. I, I think it's really important to acknowledge this. It might be kind of a rude awakening or it might sound kind of, um, it, it's, it's simultaneously like kind of a, it's, it's difficult to deal with, but it, I think it's important to know early on in your journey that you sometimes have control over the flare up, but other times you might do everything right and still have a flare up. And that just helps, I think it helps to know that because then I've seen a lot of people get stuck where they're like, well, I did everything, like they, they, they're like, just like, they are operating under the assumption that they can always prevent a flare up. And that's unfortunately not the case for everyone. I mean, some people find 
really, really strong triggers and they, they have success avoiding those, but the majority are at some point are going to experience a flare up kind of out of quote unquote out of nowhere. And so just know, you know, that that might happen and hopefully it won't, but it, it just might. And so it's not your fault. You know, we have to have some self-compassion. Um, another frequently asked question, will your blood work always show a flare up? Sometimes, but not always. And so that's why it's really important to communicate what's called like your subjective report to your doctors, which simply is what are you feeling physically and, and fatigue wise? You know, are you, how much pain are you feeling? My doctor goes way more off of, in my particular case, I'm speaking as a patient, she goes off of my subjective report a lot more than my blood work. In my case, the blood work doesn't tell the full story. Um, yeah, Carolyn, and sometimes, sometimes the medicines don't work. Um, yeah, it's, that's the sad thing too. Sometimes you don't even get that initial relief period. It's again, very complex. So, okay, so we're gonna focus again in order, we're gonna do fit, uh, pain, then fatigue, then stress, and then uh, symptom tracking and finding a little, a tiny bit more information at the end on just like how to, discuss, how to track your symptoms to figure out your fl flare, yeah, flare triggers. So in general, like uh, you might've heard this before, it's a cliche, but an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I really like to focus on prevention. So things that are shown through lots of scientific research to help prevent pain in autoimmune disease and rheumatic disease specifically are things like, again, I know it's, we all bored of hearing it after a while, but exercise and nutrition, particularly discovering dietary triggers. Some foods really cause inflammation in some people. And as one of the doctors I learned from said, inflammation do doesn't like to stay in one place. What that means is inflammation that might have started in your joint can travel all over your body. It travels to your brain, which is what causes brain fog. I didn't know that for the longest time. So it was really interesting to discover that. Um, um, can your blood, Mary Beth, that's a great question. Can your blood work ever not show any inflammation, but clearly you have, I actually, I, I don't know. That would be a really good question for a, a doctor or if there's anyone on the call who knows. Um, I, for some reason, I don't, I don't know. I, my understanding is that it usually would show some subtle signs that just might not be like the, the degree of inflammation my blood work shows doesn't track with the severity of my symptoms, but it will show a little bit of inflammation. But my understanding is that the blood work markers we have, they're not very specific, right? They're like general inflammation. Well, that could be that you're fighting a little bit of the common cold on top of your disease, or it could be your disease. So a couple other things we're going to talk about, like joint protection, sleep. Um, yeah, and if you're seronegative, it won't show. Yeah, that's true for rheumatic, rheumatoid arthritis. So in general with exercise, it is confusing that for, for many people to hear that exercise is really good for your joints because you're like, they hurt. So why would I want to move them? Um, but there's like study after study after study that shows, and one of the reasons that, um, that it, it's not just about like, quote unquote, you know, having a healthy body weight, although that can be helpful just from a mechanical standpoint to not have as much stress on your joints. But one of the things that hardly anyone talks about, and I'm jumping forward to the third um, bullet here, is that your lymphatic system is like a circulation system similar to like your circulatory system with, with your blood, but it circulates your, um, some of your immune stuff and um, an extra, what is it called? extracellular like fluid. And that circulating when, with movement is, is good for, your, for any sort of autoimmune disease. So it gets things moving and in your joints in particular, when you're at rest, um, the things stiffen up. That's why rheumatoid arthritis is characterized by morning stiffness. It's really should be called like inactivity stiffness because when you're sleeping, you're not very active. So it can be very confusing to figure out what's the best routine for you. Um, and I think that it's really beneficial to think about just movement, not necessarily exercise. It doesn't have to look like going to an exercise class. It could be dancing. It could be walking the dog, just getting any sort of movement that your body can tolerate. You know, you can, a lot of my um, Room to Thrive members really like doing yoga videos, like Yoga with Adrian on YouTube has a lot of free you know, gentle videos and um, yeah, running can be, and there's a lot of people who tolerate running. Um, but yeah, if you have a lot of inflammation, then if you're in an acute flare, that's the difference. So exercise is really good for prevention. Um, but when you're in an acute flare, sometimes it's not, it's better to, to rest a little bit or do something a little easier in your joints, like aqua exercise, because that supports your joints more. Um, 
really simple, some simple things uh, about diet and nutrition. Again, you can do, you know, years long programs on diet and nutrition, um, but know that there is not at this point in the scientific community, one diet that's universally recommended. You will hear anecdotes from many, many people and they, they have amazing experiences with totally different diets. Like there's an autoimmune protocol, there's, you know, the vegan, there's car, uh, the carnivore, what, the keto, there's so many different ones in general. And there's a lot of evidence that's starting to come out, like literally in the last few years on some sort of connection between the microbiome in your digestive tract and your immune system. But no one knows for sure what's the best way to go about uh, calming the, or cal calming whatever inflammation is going on in that area. So in general, what support, what's doctors and nutritionists are, and registered dietitians in general have been supporting an overall anti-inflammatory eating pattern. Because again, what sometimes if you, what you eat can cause further inflammation. And again, because in inflammation travels, it can travel from your stomach to your joints. So a lot of people find that tracking their food and their joint pains or fatigue is helpful. Some of the most common food triggers are sugar, gluten, red meat, processed food. I'll tell you, I've been gluten-free and nightshade-free for 12 years now, 10 years, and it hasn't had any impact on my rheumatoid arthritis, but I have stomach issues as well. Like I have something called gastroparesis and small intestine bacteria overgrowth. And it's really helped me, um, like, it makes me overall, my sense of wellness and well-being feels better because I, I'm not as bloated anymore. I used to be really bloated all the time. I didn't realize that was not normal. And so I went gluten-free initially for rheumatoid arthritis, and then it didn't help that, but it helped my bloating a lot. So um, I feel just good about that. But, you know, there are people who will say, oh my gosh, I went gluten-free. And then like 12 days later, I had like no RA symptoms. And, you know, it's, it's very confusing and overwhelming. I would say for myself personally as a patient um, and, and for many of the people I, I talk to, so I, and support, I would say in general, because it's such a um, complex area, I really recommend if you really want to pursue it, going through like a registered dietitian, there are people who have a master's degree, they've extensively studied it and they can help you parse through all the different complex like variables with diet. And I, I, not, I don't mean diet and like going on a diet, like, I mean, what you eat and, and your nutrition. Um, so I'm happy to give some recommendations. A couple other things you can do to prevent pain are thinking about protecting your joints. Um, so now this is for when you have rheumatoid arthritis, if, you're, if your little joints, like your fingers are, and wrists are hurting, you wanna use your big joints during your activities to protect your little ones. Now, if you're having something like ankylosing spondylitis, or something that may be affecting the larger joints more, it might be the opposite, right? But in general, you wanna think about like spreading the force of your daily activities across multiple areas and using bigger joints to support smaller ones. You also wanna, with rheumatoid arthritis, think about avoiding what's called ulnar drift. That's the quote unquote deformity that naturally occurs with uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis. If you look at the pictures online, you'll see pe people's fingers are kind of curled and they're all, the drift, your knuckles drift towards your pinky. So things like holding your coffee mug like this, that's actually putting a lot of pressure down towards your pinky. You can hold it like this and then have the force distributed across two joints or two hands. And um, it's more efficient ergonomically. This little pop quiz, because I'm just like lecturing at you right now. What, it, which one do you guys think are you, do you people in the audience think is better for protecting your thumbs when you have a baby. That's my little guy. Number one or number two? I'm gonna put it in the chat. Yeah, so number two is better. Well, I'm also wearing, you can see I'm wearing splints in number two, but there's a number one, when you hold things like this, the pressure is directly going down to the base of the now, this is how we all kind of naturally want to pick up a baby, right? Like I'm an occupational therapist, like I know better, but when you have your little baby right there, you're just like, not like, I'm going to use my good joint protection ergonomics. But um, in general, like holding a baby, like here I'm using, in this one, I'm using my back muscles, my shoulder muscles. I'm not just using these tiny, tiny little hand muscles. So thinking about that. No, it's okay. Don't, don't feel bad if you didn't get it right. <laughs> um, one is like the more quote unquote, like kind of natural, like how we tend to do things, right? couple other 
life hacks would be things like, you know, pacing yourself. We're going to talk about that a little more in the fatigue section. Um, using gadgets, like you guys who follow me on TikTok know, <laughs> jar opening aids, key twisting grips. For writing, um, I love pencil grips and then using alternative grasps, like stabilizing the pen between your pointer and your middle finger rather than holding it with like the tripod grasp. I can send some videos to you on some who asked in the comments and then yeah, holding your purse near your elbow instead of with your fingers. Interestingly, okay, sleep is an interesting one because I think most of us have heard of like pain somnia, right? It's when you're in pain and you're having a hard time sleeping. And a lot of times we tend to think, and I'll tell you, I used to think this, that, well, and it can be true for you, but when you're in pain, that pain makes you not be able to sleep. And that's why you can't sleep well. But weirdly enough, there's evidence and it's actually really like disturbing how they did this evidence. They took people with rheumatoid arthritis and they had them become sleep deprived. They were like, made them only sleep three to four hours a night. And they found that lack of sleep itself causes pain as well as pain can cause lack of sleep. And in, in general, the, if we get into all the statistics and the research, it's actually a stronger effect. Lack of sleep has a stronger effect on pain than pain has on lack of sleep. So in other words, prioritizing your sleep is, is something that can help prevent pain and address existing pain. So again, I, I, I don't want to like put these thoughts in your head, but like, I think sometimes the sleep stuff gets a little bit boring because it's like, oh my gosh, really? It's like, I have to go to bed the same time every night and like make it comfortable. It's like, it sounds just like it's always the same advice, right? But like, sometimes the simplest advice is the best. Thank you, Joanne. I think it's interesting too. Yeah, when I went, I went to the American College of Rheumatology Conference in 2019, the last conference I went to in person and the, the, the presentation on sleep is, was packed. Like everyone was really fascinated by it. Um, and so a couple of things, again, keeping your room cool is evident, has some evidence for helping with sleep and keeping your bedroom only for sleep or rest. I'll be honest, I have to take this little thing, my phone and just put it away. <laughs> Otherwise I do not have the self-control to stop looking at my phone when I'm trying to fall asleep. So, you know, this called sleep hygiene, kind of the idea that, you know, just like we have hygiene for other things, we have, we should have hygiene for sleep. Yeah. And I, oh my gosh, sleep is so huge for me too, for my mood, right? And everything's interrelated, mood and stress, sleep, you know, pain, fatigue, it's all interrelated. So another thing I want to make sure to mention is that you can, a lot of individuals have other like stress, other triggers for pain. So things like stress um, is, is a common one, weather changes, you know, too hot, too cold, too much sunlight. Does anyone else have a different pain trigger that I haven't mentioned already? I guess that sometimes for me, it would be like, to, like not just overexertion physically, but like overexertion mentally. Like sometimes if I'm just really mentally having to focus on something a long time, I get kind of like a f mental fatigue or brain fog, but not necessarily pain. Anyway, let me know in the comments if you have other ones. And so also, I just don't want to, I don't want to forget to mention that like in general, medical management can help prevent pain because the medications that really address the underlying disease and help stop that inflammatory process can prevent pain by putting your disease into remission, you know? So don't wanna overlook that. That's something that's really important to get on top of. And um, of course there's things like, if you have existing pain, there's medication and medical management things you can do like pain relief medicines, not just opioids, there's other kinds. And um, you know, there's over the counter, there's CBD, cannabis um, can be really helpful for some people. It, it is an analgesic and also topical creams. Like a lot of people like the Voltaren gels. Um, I like Biofreeze. It's just kind of like an icy hot type one. Yeah. And it sounds like mental exhaustion is another. No, and that's not, yeah. Using your hands and doing housework is a huge, can be a huge trigger because it's, it's exertion. You burn calories and you're moving your body a lot. Um, yeah. And hot weather. Yeah. I, cannot tolerate the heat very well. So yeah. Um, and then, okay, so what do we do? So again, we focus on prevention, but then what do we do when pain exists? I want to briefly, briefly, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to have so much to say. Um, talk about gate control theory or just put the bug in your ear to look up gate control theory. It is this idea that, be, so pain is 
uh, process, it, it starts in your peripheral nervous system, which is like in the little nerves that are in your like hands, for example, and then it travels up to your central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. And it has to go from your peripheral to your central nervous system at, in your spinal cord. That's why, for example, if you get a spinal cord injury, you can't, you, it's, it's complete spinal cord injury. You don't feel anything underneath the level of your spin, spinal cord. Anyway, point being, when it travels up to your spinal cord to your brain, before it gets up there, it, the theory is it encounters these little gates that can essentially um, change the magnitude of how strong that signal is going to get into your brain. All pain is processed in your brain. That doesn't mean that your pain is in your head. It just means that again, if that signal can't get to your brain, you're not gonna feel pain. Again, that's why a spinal, spinal cord injury, your brain is okay, but because it's like a, it's like a, um, it's like a highway, a freeway, right? And it, if you block the freeway at one point, none of the cars can get through. That's how, that's what happens like in the spinal cord injury and people get paralyzed. They can't move or sense pain. Um, but point being that what you can do is um, your actions and the things that you do and your ability to actually even do things like controlling your stress and managing your stress can actually influence whether those gates are going to be super open and allow a lot of pain signals to go up or whether those gates are going to close or be a smaller amount open. So again, this is a whole giant long theory. There's tons of articles about it, but point being that a lot of times people just say, oh, use a hot pack or use a cold pack or do these things, but they don't explain why. The reason things like heat and cold can work, I mean, there's multiple reasons. For example, if your joints are hot and inflamed and you have a lot of swelling, cold physically, it decreases circulation. So a cold pack can work for that reason. But also heat and cold are extra sensory signals. So what's, and the same with pressure. So the re, one of the reasons compression gloves are helpful is that What's happening is you're having these, all of these different, um, anyway, this is so hard to explain in a pithy way, but point being, uh, the way I like to put it is it's kind of like, you, instead of, let's say, um, one straightforward signal to my brain that's saying, I feel pain in this joint. It, if you have pressure too, it's like two different things are shouting to your brain at the same time. One's like, I feel pressure, and one's like, I feel pain, and it, it, can, it can't simultaneously process the, both of those very well. So it kind of, the way I put it in layman's terms is it just kind of dulls the sensation of pain because it's simultaneously trying to process both of those. So that's why I can, again, because um, all of these, all of these sensations, pain, temperature, pressure, they're traveling in similar roads for lack of a better word, like highways from your body parts up to your brain. So things, again, hot packs and cold packs can be good. When you have an inflammatory condition, in general, it's not recommended to apply heat onto joints that are already hot and inflamed. Heat is really good for cold, stiff joints. And I just wanna mention a lot of people love like hot wax, like paraffin baths. Um, you can get them like the ones that you can get in the nail salon. You can buy those, you know, off Amazon. Some people are just like, oh, this is a lifesaver. Um, again, compression can be helpful, pressure. And then exercise, again, in exercise and movement can be helpful in reducing pain as well. Um, there's things like a TENS unit, trans electrical something. <laughs> um, it's something that you can have at home that like, again, the, the, the theories for how all these work is the same with the vibration. It, it dulls the sense of pain by creating competing um, sensory input. Um, ultrasound and, and then ultra, there's some evidence ultrasound actually can help with tissue healing as well. And then of course, there's all sorts of alternative therapies Like I'm not endorsing these specifically, but just so you know about them, there's some evidence with, you know, acupuncture, mixed evidence, massage, um, Epsom salts, teas, supplements, all sorts of things. Um, yes. And hot and cold alternating for 15 minutes is good for circulation. Again, so I wouldn't recommend that if you're having a hot, hot, acute flare, but it can be really good for stiffness. And then mental tools. So that's why everyone keeps talking about mindfulness now. Mindfulness, mindfulness, you might be sick of hearing about it, but, or mindfulness-based stress reduction because stress is inflammatory as well. And, um, and there's all this evidence that shows when people are stressed, they, their pain appears to be processed as more, in, in more intensely. So we're gonna talk a lot more, but some of the tools people use to cope with pain or reduce existing pain 
you know, mindfulness and gratitude. Um, a lot of people find, you know, comfort in religious connections or mantras and or mantras and inspirational quotes. Like I say a lot, this too shall pass or we can do hard things. They use um, spam emails of our starting at four this morning. Oops. Um, and, oh, sorry, I think someone is uh, not muted. Um, and so I just wanted to show a quick example, like my pain toolbox. I think it's great to like literally make a box, like a bin or a basket, something cute that's like, that you know that you can go to when you are feeling a, a list of, of pain. things. Yeah. When you're feeling this way. I'm talk. trying to mute someone. It's not letting me mute them. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and so things like, again, my hot and cold packs, my compression gloves, topical pain relief. For me, it's biofreeze. I'm not saying it's right for everyone. Some people are like, I don't like biofreeze. Things that help me feel more calm, like chamomile tea and lavender scents and like fidget tools, like my little sequin pillow. This is me. I used to be in a pediatric occupational therapist. These are common things used in that. Mental tools, music has a strong association with emotions, can help you feel more calm. And then cognitive and mental tools, which we're going to talk a little bit more later. And then social. So everything's, again, all interrelated. So for me, I'm very social. Sometimes connecting to a friend or having a social gathering can help me feel more, um, more at ease and maybe provide a little bit of a distraction. Okay, so that's, again, pain. It's hard to separate all these things because they're a lot of times co-occurring. But you can have fatigue without pain or pain without fatigue. So I'm going to talk about fatigue separately. So... Again, similar to a flare, fatigue doesn't have like one per perfectly universal definition, but it's usually defined as like a debilitating period of exhaustion, interferes with daily activities. So a lot of us are like, yep, I've experienced that. Also can include decreased ability to think, which is sometimes we call mental fatigue or brain fog, decreased ability to move your body. <laughs> You're like, ah, I remember a few times being like, I just, I just need to go to the bathroom and I cannot get myself to move like out of the bed. And then whole body tiredness that is present, even if you sleep enough. That's one of the, what's one of the differentiating factors of fatigue versus sleepiness. Um, now, fatigue is multifactorial, meaning it's, it can come from multiple sources and it interlaps with other things like uh, overall pain, psychological, now this is this chart from this research article says psychological disturbance, it's kind of like a negative word, but you know, things like depression or anxiety, which are very common. And I almost think, you know, like normal when you have an autoimmune disease, um, you know, so sorry, my, my, my computer is trying to pull something up for me. So again, um, what's nice about things being interrelated is that in, an improvement in one area can have improvements in other areas. The bad thing about it is that uh, something bad happening in one area can affect the other areas as well. So I need to close this. What is going on? Sorry, I'm having like a window that's never, I've never seen before. Okay, there we go. So fatigue can come from many, many different things. Now in general, fatigue can, is correlated with inflammation. However, a lot of the most recent research is showing that it, people can have persistent fatigue even when the inflammation is well controlled as shown by their, their inflammatory markers in their blood work, they're not perfect, but, but they generally track with inflammation. Um, so inflammation also, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't like to stay in one place. It can travel to, the, to your brain, which is what causes brain fog. And it actually can directly cause metabolic disruption, which is like the energy that you get from your cells, essentially, in, in layman's terms. And that can cause the fatigue. It can also be caused by pain. And it can, uh, so pain is correlated with fatigue. Again, not always though. I like to joke, they're like different whack-a-moles, like in the old game, whack-a-mole. You have to like whack this one and whack that one. Sometimes they're the same time, sometimes they're different. And then stress. So stress is pro-inflammatory and can exacerbate fatigue as well. Um, it, can co it is correlated to exercise, meaning there's an interesting relationship between fatigue, sleep, and exercise. And basically when they had an exercise intervention, sleep got better and fatigue got better. Again, it's unintuitive, right? Because you're like, when I'm, when I'm exercising, I'm expending energy and fatigue feels like I don't have enough energy. So why would I waste some of my energy? That's why things like the spoon theory, they're really helpful in some ways, but they're not really complete because it's there are actually things you can do during the day that cost you spoons like exercise, but they actually give you more spoons back too. 
So it's not quite so simple as like a finite number of spoons. If you haven't heard of the spoon theory, it's like this metaphor developed by, by a wonderful woman with lupus who talks about like having, um, it's a way to explain fatigue to friends and family. But um, another thing, another things you should really think about if you're having really severe fatigue with your rheumatic disease is getting um, assessed for other underlying factors, things like anemia, thyroid problems, infections, medication side effects, sleep problems. Sleep apnea is much more prevalent in people with rheumatoid arthritis than the general population, even if they have no other risk factors. I hope some of you have a little extra time. I think I'm going to go like 10 minutes over if, if that's okay. Um, and then low levels of vitamin D can also be associated with fatigue. Maybe I'll just talk really fast, we'll see. So what, how can you reduce fatigue? We're gonna talk about these factors. So energy conservation is a way where you change how you approach your daily tasks to save energy. So things like, you know, chunking your task into smaller parts, for example, might be chopping up some of your food for meal prep on um, the night before so that in the morning you don't have to do as much prep for like breakfast and taking rest breaks. So that, that does help you replenish spoons. Sometimes rest does. It's just also that sometimes exertion also helps, which is so weird. Um, and in this research study that I was talking about that showed that exercise improved sleep and fatigue, it wasn't like they were doing rigorous exercise. It was a mixture of walking, resistance training, meaning just lifting small amounts of weights and stretching for 30 to 60 minutes a day. Now that is a lot if you do it every single day. But, um, but it's not like they were running marathon, right? So it's, it's accessible to a lot of people. Again, you also wanna look at other fatigue triggers, stress or mental health. Um, you know, mental stress can definitely cause a sense of physical fatigue. I don't, I'm curious if all of you, anyone has ever had the experience before of like really having only mental fatigue and not physical fatigue or only physical fatigue and not mental. Like, I think of the example for myself of like laying in bed when you're like your body's really tired, but your mind is just going like a mile a minute and you have no brain fatigue, but only body fatigue versus having like, um, so your brain, you're having mental fatigue, but your body's like, I could go run around right now, but your brain's just like, uh, so that, that's, that's how for me, it's, it can be one or not the other. Yeah. Or you can have at the same time. Um, and so, you know, sunlight is a huge trigger for many people, especially with lupus. But for me with rheumatoid arthritis, it's also a big trigger and heat as well. Yeah. And, and, um, Tai Chi can be super, super, super helpful. That's a great way of like, um, mild exercise. A couple other triggers um, could be, again, heat as well as sunlight. They can be separate, right? You can be out in the sunlight with no heat, like, you know, on a mountain skiing or something. And then of course, overexertion. <coughs> oh yeah, Lindsay, you have lupus, rheumatoid rice and lupus. Yeah, so that's, can be really hard. It's like, is it the lupus? Is it the RA? Is it the medicine? Is it the, is it something I did today? So, um. Again, another, a few other ways to prevent and, and treat fatigue would be like with dietary changes. Some people find, again, the anti-inflammatory eating pattern, avoiding pro-inflammatory foods and food triggers. Um, some people find more energy with intermittent fasting. It's not recommended by a, a, some of my favorite registered dietitians, but I just wanted to mention it because some people do have success for it. Um, yes, and having a flare up because of your job, yeah. No, no, it's okay. I, I will talk about that and, and typing. Yeah. Um, and then talking to your doctor, because I, I didn't know this till I was in some patient groups, but you know, some doctors will prescribe like stimulant medications, like ADHD medication to give you more energy because they, they are stimulants or supplements or other medical interventions. Okay. So the stress is my favorite thing to talk about, but I think I'll go fast through this because I already have some other trainings I can send you on this. I just did one three months ago, but Again, when we think back to about like the known triggers versus unknown, it's really, really helpful mentally to like separate solvable versus persistent problems with your autoimmune disease. So solvable problems might be like, my joints are a little stiff in the morning. The solution is a warm shower or hot pack and it helps you feel better. But there are these like perpetual or persistent problems. Things for me, like those flare ups that come out of nowhere or other unknowns, like uncertainty, how, what's going to happen in the future? How can I, you know, will I find a medicine that works? How can I cope with this? So again, like I mentioned earlier, I think if you approach things, or a lot of people try to say like, I have the answer. Like all you have to do is do my diet or do my supplement and you're never going to have a flare ever again. And 
it, it, there are some people who have that experience, but most people don't, <laughs> at least the ones that I've talked to. And from my, from the research is that there's going to be flare ups. And so uh, acknowledging and accepting ahead of time that there's some parts of this disease that are not like immediately solvable or don't have like a clear path for prevention. It actually, weirdly enough, it sounds like it might be depressing. I'm sorry if it is, but for me, it's actually been really freeing and helpful because I, there's a, I do have a limited amount of energy, like mental and physical energy each day, right? So if I think, if I operate under this assumption that if I just did everything perfectly, I'll never have a flare again, then I'm going to be, when I'm not feeling well, I'm gonna be using a lot of energy trying to like maximize everything in my life, right? Like, oh, I have to do the perfect diet, the perfect sleep. I have to do the, all about like, like controlling everything. And I've seen a lot of people with rheumatic diseases, they get really caught up in that perfection mentality, particularly when it comes to diet. There's actually a, there's actually a mental condition called orthorexia that a few of my um, friends have had where it's like you become obsessed uh, not like anorexia but you become obsessed with healthy eating you have to do everything perfectly healthy and that's not helpful for your stress levels either but my argument for this is it's about how much energy you're going to spend in your life in, on can you do you want to spend it on things that ultimately might not actually help you because this disease is kind of unpredictable or do you want to spend some of that energy saying okay this is what is available to me in this present moment right now. Even though I have some pain, even though I have some fatigue, if I accept that that's just how it is, then what's available to me, it kind of frees up this mental energy from like this myopic idea of like, I have to perfect, I have to be a perfect patient, perfectly um, like control everything. Yeah, what is perfect anyway, as, as Lindsay's saying in the comments. And again, I'm not, I would, I'm like the last person that would say like, don't, you know, don't try to manage your disease. Well, of course, there's a, a lot of benefits in like knowing all the tools in your toolbox. And I spend a lot of time educating people on that. But I also think that acceptance can be so helpful. Um, and I'll say like example, this is one of my little graphics I've, I've made, but you know, will this flare get better? There, that's an, un, there's, that's a question that has an uncertain answer, right? When you're in the moment, the present moment in a flare up, you don't know for sure whether it will get better. So it's an uncertain situation. And there's kind of like three ways that your that people's brains tend to look at these. You can either have door number three, which is like doom and gloom, like it's never gonna get better. There's no hope. I might as well not try. That's that's kind of like the depressive explanatory style. Um, and again, I'm not, that's totally valid. If that's where your brain goes, that's totally, <laughs> valid. It's just, it's not the most helpful mindset for you to engage in your, in your life. Then there's door number one, which is the positive thinking or this kind of like con, kind of seeking control. Like if I, it will get better, right? The question is, will my flare get better? Number number one is it definitely will get better. All I have to do is just control it or do this perfect thing. And, you know, if I just figure it out, it'll get better. And I just need to try harder and think positive and do everything perfect. And that's comforting short term, right? That's totally where my brain wants to go. This is why I've like this acceptance thing has like rocked my world in a positive way because I know what it's like to go to want to go to door number one. I'm I don't tend to go to door number three as often, but it's definitely I've had phases where I have. And yeah, yeah, forgiving yourself, having self-compassion is very freeing. And that's why door number two is accepting uncertainty. Accepting doesn't have to mean you like it. It just means that you accept that that is what is happening. So it might get better and it might get worse. So that's the difference between two and three. Three is like, it definitely will get worse. It's definitely horrible and nothing's ever gonna get better. Door number one is it's definitely going to get better. So see, there's our certainty. So your brain wants certainty and black and white answers because it's simple and it's comforting. But um, door number two is having to accept uncertainty. My poor therapist has had to work with me on this. Um, and, but I'm like, I finally get it, <laughs> um, that it might get better. It might, it might get worse. Like we literally don't know in the present moment. All I, what I can do is try to still have a meaningful and enjoyable life despite this uncertainty. That's the way of ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And that's like my favorite thing actually to talk about with all this stuff. Um, so 
again, talking about the limited energy you have, you definitely is beneficial to think about ways to make the problem go away, reduce pain and fatigue. Like I already mentioned, all these different things, prioritizing sleep, using your hot packs and your tools, attempting to cure or heal your condition. I don't spend a lot of time on that anymore, but again, if that's where you want to go, totally work on it. You know, it can, it can, it can work for you potentially. Um, from then there's the, what we call an OT an occupational therapy, it compensatory strategies, working around it and functioning despite it, you know, adaptations, so can you, we do some life hacks given my existing pain or fatigue? Can we pace ourselves? What can I still do now? And so, yeah, if you're still working on door number two, you're not alone. I'm still working on door number two. And it's very, very common to vacillate quickly between like all three, right? Like, ah, it's never gonna get better. Oh, yes, it is. I'm gonna be happy again. Oh, maybe it's just uncertain. You know, it's totally, it's a work in progress. And that's why, so a lot of times people think mindfulness just means like, sitting up, well, I guess this picture isn't helping, but sitting on a placid, you know, plane and, and calming your mind and feeling at peace. But actually mindfulness, as far as I understand it from some of my research, it's keeping your attention in the present moment without judging it as happy or sad or good or bad. So it's whatever is happening in the present moment. So learning how to observe your thoughts without judgment or trying to change. And that means if you're in pain, being able to observe yourself in pain. And it's hard, right? Because when you're in pain, that's usually the last thing you want to do is think about your pain. Like I remember when my therapist first taught me this, I was like, uh, I literally said like, you're a sadist. Like, why would I want to do this? <laughs> but the idea is what we, when we try to distract ourselves and focus only on eliminating the pain, the pain has the power over you right? Because you're, you're, you're saying that I, it's communicating to yourself subtly that I can't handle this pain. Like this is, I can't, I have to do something about it. Whereas taking a moment, this is not like your whole life being like, oh, well, I'm just going to like feel my pain, but taking a moment to allow yourself to just connect to the present moment, it actually teaches your brain that you can handle it. It's really weird, but it, it's worked for me at least. Um, and so ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy. So the, it, it's a long whole thing, but um, you know, it stands for accepting our thoughts and feelings. That includes physical sensations, connecting to your values and then taking action. So it's not just about thinking about what's going on and, and like having a little moment. It's actually about like changing your behavior based on what you value. So you make room for your feelings and sensations, allowing them to be exactly as they are. Then you ask, what can I do right now that's truly meaningful or important in my life? And that is different from asking, how can I feel better? And that's what's really freed me. And this is, that's from Russ Harris, who's an amazing psychologist. He wrote The Happiness Trap, which is all about this approach. And um, because when you are engaged in this focus on, I have to feel better. I have to feel better. I have to feel better all the time. It ends up controlling your life for many people versus saying, okay, this is what it is. Like, and I still have options, right? Like I kind of say, sometimes it's a little bit tough love, but like, unless you're in a coma, like you still have a lot that you can do. And it's not, it doesn't mean that you have to like it, right? Like I would prefer not to have rheumatoid arthritis. I would prefer not to have pain and fatigue. And, but you know, this is what I have, you know, there's still possibilities for me to have a wonderful life. So it, again, it's what they call it is take, take, turning off the struggle switch. So instead of seeing these emotions as like problems to be solved, like anxiety, anxiety about anxiety, sadness, frustration, guilt, you're like, I just need to be feel, feel better all the time. You say, hmm, I have anxiety, I have stress, you know, understandably, because I have the stressful autoimmune disease. I don't want it or like it, but I'm not gonna struggle with, I'm just, I'm just gonna allow it. It's really weird, but it works. Okay. Another thing, this is that, so that's acceptance-based therapy and mindfulness-based approach. There's also more traditional cognitive behavior therapy. Just want to give you a quick exercise called catching ants. And this is where you think about like, there are, there, there are benefits to change, changing like negative thoughts that are not helpful for you, right? Like sometimes they're distortions. So I call them ants, automatic negative thoughts. So a, a common one would be filtering, like having a distorted filter so you only pay attention to what's bad like not again pay attention only to the pain and not what else is available in your life or in this case like i have a lot i actually surprisingly for somebody who's kind of like a happy personality i have a lot of negative thoughts all the time i i think oh i'm stupid i'm not good enough you know but what i do is i just i examine that thought for a moment 
And I, I know that there's a repercussion of that, right? If you forget to take your meds and your brain is like, I'm stupid, you're going to end up feeling frustrated and angry and you're going to have behaviors from that feeling, right? Irritability and then and that has a cascading effect versus having self-compassion and saying, I forgot to take my meds. Oh, I'm human. It happens. I can have self-compassion and feel fine about this because I'm just, again, I make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, right? And then I'm not going to have that cascade of, of negativity. So that's just one other mental exercise. So again, recapping what's in my stress toolbox, because talking about this is always supposed to be about flare-ups, right? Well, how does this all relate? Well, again, when you get caught in this struggle switch, struggle with your emotions, it's very stressful because you're trying to control your mind <laughs> and your mind does not want to be controlled very easily, right? So it puts you at a less inflammatory state to be able to accept the present moment. And yes, Don, thank you. Yes, and I will I'll see you a little bit. Um, and then I also just want to mention a couple other tools I use, like gratitude and journaling. Like I mentioned earlier, music and socializing. And then distraction can be good for short-term distractions, just not a really sustainable long-term strategy because at some point you have to like be in your life, right? And then quickly going to mention symptom tracking because you know a lot of this is about finding your unique flare triggers, okay? So when you track your symptoms, uh, people have different preferences. First of all, like I'm in this weird sandwich generation where like I do actually prefer to do a lot on pencil paper, but a lot of younger people like to do, you know, computer trackers or apps. I can give you lots of recommendations. I don't have one app that I love the most, but there are a lot of great free ones out there and a few paid ones too. You can track pain, stiffness, fatigue, and stress. Those are kind of the four for rheumatoid arthritis that I track the most. And then you can correlate them to nutrition, exercise, your stress management choices like meditation or mindfulness, and then your other external factors. And that can give you a great sense of like self-efficacy or the knowledge that there are ways that you can prevent pain and, um, and fatigue from happening and cope with them. Whew, I take a breath for a second. Okay, so as a recap, we focus on prevention, discovering your triggers, and remembering that some things are out of your control. And accepting that can go a long way into helping you remember that you still have other things you can do in your life and you can still have a good quality of life and then manage stress. So I am going to talk about quickly a bonus tool that is my um, Thrive Toolbox. So I mentioned Room to Thrive earlier. That's my online support and education group. And we talk for six, every six months, we focus on a different one of these. So we have a whole month on tools for pain and fatigue, a whole month on healthy habits, a whole month on relationships and social life and friendships and connections, and then a whole world, a month on inner world, and then valued activities and hobbies, and then these CEO skills, executive functions, like symptom tracking. And I really, I want you to know that, you know, you don't have to cope with all this on your own. And I do a lot of free trainings like this webinar, but I also do have this more intensive, you know, support group called Room to Thrive. And it includes these three live video calls every month and then an ongoing like, online support group. Yes, thank you, Emma. No, no problem. Yes, yeah. And I do have like, I'm going to send you all this little, there's a, there's a little bit of a bonus if you join Room to Thrive. The registration literally opened right now. And, um, you know, there, there are lots of testimonials I'll share with you, but I'll just keep going for now. Um, and there's a bonus if you do sign up before tomorrow at 6 p.m. So it's it's $37 a month, um, or you can do the six month option, which is 172, that saves you $50. And also you get my rheumatoid arthritis roadmap course for free, which is in 197 value. So I'm just I'm trying to get like, kind of make it easy for people to make the decision to join if they're on the fence. Cause it, it really has been incredible. Um, the last few months to, to run this group. I used to do it as part of the roadmap course and now I'm doing it as like an ongoing group. And um, you know, I've had some great testimonials from the rheumatoid arthritis roadmap. That's a, a self-paced online course that goes into a lot of what I've talked about today in more details. Um, but I did wanna leave some time for questions. And oh, here, I'm gonna put this, I, I, I wanna send, give you my um, page with all my information and links. Um, and I will, again, I'll be sending you all the recording. I'm going to take some time for, for live questions right now, um, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other better. But um, I 
also wanted to answer the question about work. So, <laughs> so on a totally different note, someone asked about um, typing. So my biggest recommendation or my biggest thing I tell people to think about is speech to text or voice dictation if typing is difficult for you. So um, voice dictation software includes things like Dragon Naturally Speaking. Um, has anyone ever used voice dictation to dictate things so that you're not like um, having to sit there and type? Anyone? Okay. It's really great. And a lot of workplaces will um, actually provide it for you. I know Christy uses it on your phone. Yeah, Mary Beth uses it. And I just put the little link in the in here. I think most of you have my email too um, for the for the support group. But um, yeah, like that is a really great way to save your hands. Um, of course, you can also look into like, um, I, I like keyboards that have that big bump. I don't have one. I have one um, at home, but I'm not at home right now. I'm just on like a little like laptop thing. Um, but you know, that definitely puts um, your hands in a more neutral position. When you have a flat keyboard and you're actually doing what's called pronating a little bit, and it's not like the natural resting position of your hands. Um, have you ever seen these kind of, this is actually a really great, I can't make my brain learn to type like that very easily, but if I, I probably should have, like, do one of these like weird keyboards that's like this, and, and then there's also the vertical mice that like this is a nice neutral position for your hands. Oh yeah, children are and dogs and pets are welcome, by the way. <laughs> Hi. So um so that's what I recommend a lot of times or say that to look into is um speech dictation. You know, I'll say like from my work as an occupational therapist, I did a three-month internship in spinal cord rehabilitation. There's people who are completely paralyzed from like the essentially like upper chest or neck down who hold down full-time jobs and control their computer all through their voice. You know, so if they can do it, we can do it with our brains, right? That's like kind of my thought process, but it is a huge learning curve. So I don't want to minimize it. It's not easy to necessarily learn how to dictate all, everything, but you can control all your computer through, through voice commands. Any other questions? Like I'm, I'm here for another five or six minutes. If there's, you can unmute yourself, um, you know, about, about life, about what I just talked about. I feel like I just like threw all this information at you or about the room to thrive. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, today is one year since you had the flare up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. And, yeah. Please feel free to like email me any, uh, also if you have any follow up, you know, questions, I know this was a lot of information, but yeah, like, um, it's, yeah, I have had that same experience. Like Kelly mentioned having struggled for years in retrospect. I honestly think this is just from my experience working with so many people with these diseases that a lot of people with autoimmune disease and rheumatic disease are just like tough. You know what I mean? Like, how do you guys feel like you, you like push through a lot, you know? And so sometimes that's actually not in our favor. I remember one of the doctors who I was working with was like, you know what? Sometimes it's not in your favor because you push through so much. And then um, it it's harder to backtrack. And like, once you have inflammation, once you're flaring, it's harder to get it back under control than it is to prevent it. Have I ever encountered anyone with RA having bursitis? Yes, my understanding is that that you are more likely to have bursitis if you have rheumatoid arthritis. Unfortunately, I don't know what the best way to prevent uh, bursitis is, sadly. But if you basically, if you have some form of inflammation, like like arthritis means artho is joint, itis is inflammation, right? So arthritis, the word means joint inflammation. Um, and so if you have one inflammatory process going on, like inflammation in your joints, you're going to be more likely to have a different kind of inflammation too. So bursitis is inflammation of the bursa. I forget what the technical definition of the bursa. Um, it's like the, I know it's part of your joint. It's a slippery sack of fluid that prevent, provides a cushion and reduces friction between bone and soft tissue. Okay, there we go. I always like don't trust my... Um, free recall memory. Free recall is like your ability to remember the definition of something um, off the top of your head. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Monica, your husband listened too. That's great. He's learning to be your cheerleader. Yeah, having a support system. I should have put that under stress, but um, having a support system and understanding in your friends and family members can go such a long way. And I'll put in the, in the comments, um, 
my a podcast episode that I'm like one of my favorite ones that I've done. I have a podcast if you didn't know that. <laughs> um, uh, that it was about eight things everyone who loves someone with arthritis should know. Oh no, sorry, it's even longer than that. <laughs> it's called "It's Not Just Joint Pain" and eight other things everyone who loves someone with arthritis should know. I once talked to somebody who's like a search engine optimization expert, and they were like, "You need to make shorter titles." Like. <laughs> Google does not like these long titles. Um, yeah, and Joanne, if you have multiple illnesses like Sjogren's as well, like they say, you know, autoimmune diseases don't like to travel alone, meaning like if you have one, you're more likely to have another. It's really frustrating. I'm so sorry you have Sjogren's too. And it can be really hard. Is it my Sjogren's? Is it this? Is it that? Is it, is it, I joke sometimes, is it like that thing where if a butterfly flaps its wings and Africa, the weather changes where you are. Like it could literally, sometimes you could go, that's why I like sometimes find it more useful depending on the time to say, this is just random. And I don't wanna just engage in this like kind of, sometimes I feel like I can be a fool's errand to try to figure out exactly what caused it. And I can just say, okay, it's here, what can I do? Um, yeah, and don't, don't worry. Um, yeah, you need one of the glitter pillows. Yes, <laughs> yes, get a glitter pillow. Yeah, and that's again, I'm like, I'm just, I love kid stuff. I've like always loved kid movies and all that stuff. And so I'm like, I love a lot of this stuff that some people think is childish, you know, like these little cute, like kid, you know, hand warmers. I know not everyone's like that. You know, I'm like, I'm about to be 40. Like, am I gonna, I think I'm just gonna like this stuff forever, I guess, you know? Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, is it lupus? Is it RA? Yeah. Oh, good. Lindsay likes kid things too. I'm not alone. Yeah. For a long time, I used to think, oh, well, you have to be like more mature and like change. But anyway, um, yeah. And is it Hashimoto's? Is it, you know, AR? Yeah. Rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. When I say RA, it's my shortening for rheumatoid arthritis. But yeah, I know if you're Spanish speaking, um, it's AR. Arth is it arthritis rheumatoid something? <laughs> Yes, arthritis or rheumatoidea. Rheumatoidea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't speak yeah. English pretty well, but uh, I understand. <laughs> oh, good. No, I can hear. Uh, yeah, I understood you too. And yeah, I know I spoke really, really fast. So, what I could try to do also, and someone's asked me this before, is I can try to get like a transcription of this to put underneath the video. Um, and then even like a translation. It won't be perfect, but. Um, you know, that could help for getting it translated to Spanish, at least. Um, I know I have a friend, if you haven't read the magazine, um, A-U-C-H Revista, um, it's a magazine about uh, autoimmune or rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatic issues and stuff. Um, this is really good. And I've written a guest article for her before. And I know I do want to be more accessible um, to other, you know, to, to other language speakers that English, I don't want to be like that American who's like, everyone speaks English. No, that's not true. Oh, and Lizette, you're from Dominican Republic. Hi, I was just thinking about Dominican Republic because I watched um, In the Heights, the movie, the musical with Lin-Manuel Miranda, and they talk a lot about the Dominican Republic. That sound, it, it looked really, um, really beautiful. I know it's, it's just a movie, so it's not real, but, <laughs> but yay. Okay, so I think I'm gonna wrap up in the next minute. Is there anything else? Um, yes, and thank you for speaking of fatigue. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you for doing this. And speaking of fatigue, you need to take a nap. Yeah. Yes. And I think one of my other soapboxes is fatigue is just kind of overlooked a lot of times, but like fatigue can affect our quality of life so much, right? Just even more than pain for me sometimes because pain to a certain degree you can push through, but fatigue, sometimes it's like you can't push through. Like you literally can't make yourself do stuff sometimes when you're so fatigued. So um, you know, so, oh, good. I'm so glad. It's so good to see some, I've seen some of you in other trainings, so it's good to see you again. And, oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm available for all compliments. Just keep them, no, just kidding. <laughs> I joke that because I was raised in the eighties, they had what's called like the self-esteem movement where it was like, tell your child they're special, give everyone a trophy and everyone gets a gold star. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm the result of what happens because I'm like, what do they call it? Like you get, kids get like addicted to that uh, compliments and like being told that they're special. You know what I mean? So like, oh, I need my gold star. I need to be told I'm special. No, but it's okay. I'm, it's okay. And if you didn't like this, that's okay. You know, I'm trying to become more like, you know, 
accepting that not everyone, I, I, again, I wish I could just be like, I have the diet or I have the solution. You never get a flare again, like to provide hope in that way. I just, I don't know of anything that's really verified to be, to work for everyone. So, um, yeah. Oh, and Robin, you turned 40 this year and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and now the movement is like to work on mindset for children and growth mindset. So you're supposed to be like, uh, praise them on their effort, not the outcome. But I'm like, that would have been so frustrating for me as a kid. I'm like, like, they'd be like, thank you. Good. I noticed how you worked really hard on that drawing. And I'd be like, yeah, but is it good? Tell me it's good. You know, <laughs> tell me that the outcome is actually good. Oh, and Rose, you're newly diagnosed. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that this is helpful. I'm going to stop the recording because